welcome to Garden Philosophy. I hope you've been enjoying this series, and this time we'll continue on our conversation. Is conventional agriculture worth it? What are the solutions we have to offer? Stay tuned. Continuing our conversation, I'll start with a comment from Science Olympiad VRK. And they write, Thank you for opening up the conversation. Besides economics, there is a philosophical disagreement in there as well. Some people want to protect the earth and save it from overpopulation and for the sake of environmentalism, whereas others don't hold to those ideas and therefore won't listen to the first group. We need to appeal to the second group to realize that if we take better care of the environment, then the earth can sustain our population because every human life matters. Everyone who can should start growing some food to supplement their grocery lists. This will enable people to spend more on organic food sources and can maybe um, help to get a, a big agricultural company to realize that we don't want to be poisoned anymore. When the money stops or slows down, they will look for better solutions. That's a really good point. First point, yes, we should do it. It's cheaper, it's more accessible. If you live in the suburbs, there's absolutely no good reason why you are not doing this already. It's good for your health, it's great exercise, it's great for your mental health, so do it, yes. Now, the part, the economic part where if we start to have spend more money on organic, two things can happen. One thing is, indeed, companies can go and see that we don't want to for those chemicals to be used and there there is a, a threshold point where they see that enough customers are responding to a certain trend they'll s understand that the the reverse trend which is conventional um foods that were grown with toxic chemicals don't actually have any clear advantage other than price but if people are willing to pay more, they're going to go into that immediately. And that's why the organic uh, movement has grown so much. The other possibility is that organic can actually be watered down. That means that companies, once they see that there is profit in the brand organic, and not necessarily in the idea, they'll push to water down the restrictions on organic. And that will just make it for weaker um a weaker concept of what organic means. Now, a second comment came up, and it's less rosy, I would suppose. And how to be self-sufficient writes, Modern agriculture and herbicide companies are killing millions of people around the world. Companies pride themselves on being a legal person in its own right, and this protects the investors from being sued. The companies should be brought to trial for murder, and if found guilty, they should be sentenced to death, which means the complete closure of the company. This is the only way to bring the, this deadly contamination to an end. Have a marvelous day. Well, you know what? How to be self-sufficient. I actually... I, I can't say I don't... I don't share some of those same opinions, perhaps not in the same intensity, because I don't necessarily think we can equate what the companies are doing with murder specifically because you would have to prove there is intention of killing and I don't think that is the case and I, I would not argue for that I don't I don't think that's the main driver there are economic drivers for why they do what they do and technological drivers also again Pesticides, herbicides, they work, even if short-term. Of course, such a strong accusation needs a rebuttal. And Troy Haverson comes and writes, Yeah, there's poison in the food, but there's no killing or murder involved because people choose to purchase and eat it. It's all voluntary. Sad, but true. Yes, I agree with him. I agree, it's a case of choice. Now, doesn't mean that people necessarily are making the best choice for themselves, 
doesn't mean they necessarily are in a condition where they know what is the best choice for them because they might be seeing things only in one perspective and that perspective is the food is tasty, the food is cheap, I'll eat it. I like it, I eat it. They are not seeing the whole bigger, broader scheme of things to make an informed decision. That's why education is paramount and that's why my goal is to spread information and open up discussion. Even if I cannot state I hold all truth, I am open to investigate and understand things better. Now I believe there is a difference between organic and conventional um, chemical farming and because I believe in that I act accordingly. Does not mean that I eat a strictly organic diet, I do not. I have financial constraints where I do need to buy conventionally grown produce and obviously there are certain items which are more toxic to the end consumer than other items. For instance, berries are known to to be a better choice to buy organically because of their soft, thin skin that you won't peel, so you'll most likely get more in, in closer contact with pesticides that way. Now, there are other issues concerning why paying more for organic is worthwhile if you can afford that and we'll have to go into those details in a further episode. But my main reason why I believe that organic is best is because of the soil. The soil is the building block of life on earth because it's able to transform solar energy with the help of plants into nourishment to all the species that live here. And one of the main things or one of the reasons why organic is considered to be superior for soil health is because it conditions the soil to be more fertile physically. And this may come as a surprise to a lot of people, but there are things called soil glues that hold the particles of soil, because soil is mainly minerals that have been broken up. So it's rock that's been aged and broken. And, but that's not all of soil. Soil is also the living part, the animals, but for the animals, for the, the microorganisms who live in the soil, for them to survive, for them to be able to live there, have the right conditions to live there, the soil needs to have a certain structure. It's similar to why a city needs to be built in a certain way for people to find it livable. If you go into the middle of a war-torn city and tell people, okay, live there, with everything destructed and falling apart, people are gonna have to work a lot to, to be able to live there. There's gonna be lots of incidences of death and just because the, the pattern, the environment around them is not right. So it's important to have the right structures. And these soil glues, they're able to hold things up and how do you get that? You increase the organic matter, the carbon, the plant, the dead plants that will be eaten up by certain fungi and certain bacteria and they create soil glues and they're able to feed plants through exudates too but that's for another episode. But I like to talk about specifically glomalin which is a substance produced by fungi, it's a protein. What this substance, glomalin, does, it's incredible. It helps glue up the pieces of soil. It's like a cement, a microscopic cement. It glues up the pieces of soil so that there are more channels and pores so that water and air can enter the soil and make it a viable habitat for other organisms and plants and plant roots. It just increases the fertility. These soil aggregates held together, they act like a sponge and they're able to hold the water, the moisture and the air and not be washed away in rain. And that's a huge thing for soil conservation. And we have to learn from history. The American Midwest in the 30s went through what's called the Dust Bowl 
and that was a catastrophic event for agriculture and it, ha it happened to happen in the middle of the Great Depression which also did not help so there was extreme poverty in America much akin to poverty found in developing countries nowadays so it wasn't until further on that they discovered that their practices, their cultural practices, agricultural practices, was destroying the earth. The Dust Bowl was a dark moment in agricultural history. It was when humans finally were able to mechanize farming to an industrial um, format so that you could have tractors and plows and combines and that impact in the semi-arid um, grasslands of America, th that soil, which actually was a s very fertile soil, um, there are accounts of, of grasses as tall as six foot or, or more, um, and root systems that were very deep into the earth. And that's a very dense um, system. Un unlike the rainforests, which also are are very full of foliage but they don't have uh, trees don't actually put down roots that deeply because the soil is not as rich it's not as fertile as the the plains because of the agricultural practices the soil became friable it became easily blowable so that when drought came in and the wind swept through, the soil would pick up into these huge ominous clouds and just cover everything with dust and nothing could grow in it. It was a terrible, terrible time in the Midwest and were it not for the efforts to to implement soil conservation through um, cover cropping and um, low, low tilling and other and even I have to say the use of herbicides instead of cultivation were it not for those efforts all the soil there would have vanished or become unusable they were able to stabilize the soils eventually but that doesn't mean the current practices are building soil um, there are reports that soil is lost every year through erosion through wind and even with the using the principles of, of um, low tail and cover crops because of the high mechanized chemical basis of commercial farming there's still an impact there and finally I want to talk about what some people have been doing themselves to get in peace or come to peace with the idea that they do not want to continue supporting conventional uh, practices they want cleaner real food and what they exactly are doing for that so we we have Ian from Lolita's Garden a channel which actually I highly recommend and I think everyone who's watching should go and watch Lolita's Garden and see Ian's um, progress towards a more sustainable way of life. And Ian writes, tough topic and one we've given much thought over the years. Our goal is to unplug from a poisonous system and to focus solely on doing that. Us first. We hope that after the establishment of a natural way of life we can help lead by example. Because stewing over the slow death of our natural systems while living in an efficiency apartment, driving our poison mobile 40 minutes to and from work every day, and writing letters to Congress hasn't worked. When people see the eggs appear at their doorstep every morning, when yogurt doesn't have to be made in a 2.2 gigawatt factory and shipped in poison canisters by poisonous trucks and that food, real food, actual food, is all around them, we hope they will see how they can change their lives to live in accordance with their very nature. Commendable. And he's an incredible guy, raising an incredible family. Rob Bob from Australia, another 
amazing individual. You should watch his channel. Um, he writes, Really enjoy the clips, Loe, and I am a subscriber to your way of thinking. I still see the need for some large cropping systems to produce the grain and oil crops, but I don't think they have to be monocultures, though, and produced on the scale they currently are. I'm sure a change in diet towards a fresh fruit, veggie, and away from fried foods would see a huge reduction for the need for so many acres covered with soy, rape, seed, canola, and sunflower, not to mention the sugar crops. I suppose the challenge is to get folks to be more responsible for their own food and to grow on a local level. Exactly right. We need to instill in others the passion for food. When we understand that food is not just something that will kill your hunger, it's a greater link of humans to the earth. When we do that, we transcend our relationship with food, with the earth, with everything that's around us because we understand that it's a symbiotic relationship. We are not here only taking, we are also giving and hopefully taking good care of our home. I like to end with a very positive video I've watched. It's called Life in Centropy. You can find it on YouTube. It shows the work that's being done in a bigger scale, which is something that people usually who are critics of home gardeners and organic um, farming, and they, they say, oh, this, this works for you, but it might not work for everyone because it's not scalable. And they, they have points to the criticism. But I would invite, if you hold this, even if it's in the back of your thought, of your mind, if you hold this thought, please watch this video, Life and Centropy. It distills everything that's possible, or every, all the possible directions we need to start researching more on to be able to have a more peaceful relationship with our home and the creatures that live around us. In this video, we see the work of Ernest Gorsch. He is, I believe he's a German, I could be wrong, living in Brazil. He's creating systems using principles of permaculture that effectively create abundant yield in a mixed rotation with um, management that's actually feasible and it's economically viable. You have to watch this. And the other point that Rob Bob had made is that indeed, if we change our diets towards a diet that's less dependent on grain, if we start valuing more of local foods, and if you're in the tropics, that's easier. You can have, you can put more fresh fruits and produce, and if you're in a temperate zone, perhaps more vegetables, because that's what naturally grows in these areas. If we can tailor our our diets towards a more healthy solution, we will live in a better world, and we will not need to poison ourselves to gain a buck. So I hope this was constructive, and please share your thoughts in the comments below, and join the conversation. It's going to be a growing movement, it's going to be a work in progress, we do not have all the answers. We invite you to start looking for yourself also and supporting those who are seeking a higher purpose in feeding the world. Thank you.